Are you ready for the weekend yet? We have events, news, and a guest for you to enjoy this Lake Life weekend. Hello to another episode of Lake Life Weekend Podcast. I'm Dirk, I'm your host, and school is almost out. Labor Day weekend is ahead of us, and we are in full swing with lots of activity in Lakes Country. Thank you very much for tuning in and enjoy our interview with Carl Koenig. He is um, the head of the Becker County Soil and Water Conservation District, and he will be speaking about aquatic invasive species and all the good things that um, the uh, Becker County Soil and Water Conservation District does for us to preserve our waters. So stay tuned. There's a very interesting interview and I'm glad that he joined us uh, this week. Also, go to our daily updated website to stay tuned on uh, activities, events, uh, destinations, road trips. We have uh, recipes and all nice things for you at lakelifeweekend.com. Thank you for checking that out. Also, thank you for tuning in and also to our sponsor here. We have Ed Ease Dock and Lift uh, still sponsoring us and supporting this podcast for you to enjoy. They're right east out of Detroit Lakes and they have many docks and lifts systems for you to check out. Um, speak to Mike or John at Ed Ease Dock and Lift uh, right before Frazee on Highway 10. Yeah, I don't want to keep this any longer from our interview with Carl Kinnick. Becker County Soil and Water Conservation District. Thanks again. Have a wonderful weekend and Labor Day ahead. Yeah, hello to our interview part. I'm here with uh, Carl Koenig um, of the Becker Soil and Water Conversation District. Uh, I just clarified uh, that uh, title of the organization. Welcome, Carl. Thanks, Dirk. Yeah. Before we talk about um, the background of your organization, maybe a little history uh, and what your goals are and how successful you have been and your work area, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Are you from Lakes Country? Um, what have you done before you arrived? Yes, I grew up in, in the area just north of Detroit Lakes on Buffalo Lake. Lived there and until I was 18 years old. At that time, I moved to western Montana. And then in 2012, I, I moved home with my wife back to Detroit Lakes. Oh, wow. And um, did you attend uh, school in Montana? I did. I, I earned a Bachelor's of Science degree in resource conservation from the University of Montana. I uh, completed that in 2008. Okay. Okay, so you are an outdoor passionate. That's right. <laughs> and um, um, I always see people leave and come back. Um, so going to Montana, what really drove you back to Minnesota, if I may ask? Well, you know, my family is here in Detroit Lakes, and living in western Montana, it was a challenge to uh, get myself established and find a, a career path. And, uh, you know, it's hard to be away from family. As I got to the point where I was ready to get married and start my own family, I wanted to be closer to uh, both my family and my wife's family uh, in Chicago. 
Okay, closer to home. That's right. Yeah, and um, so uh, you had a job opportunity uh, that that was came with coming home. That's right. In 2012, I took a job with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and uh, that's when I began working on uh, aquatic invasive species prevention work in in Minnesota. So, what is it exactly um, that you do, or like your chapter, or can you? bring some light in the in the organization and the greater scope and then we zoom in to the work in Becker County? Sure, sure. Um, well, my work in aquatic invasive species you know, started, like I said, in 2012. I worked as a watercraft inspector out there at the lakes, uh, teaching folks about invasive species and actually making sure people were following the laws related to invasive species prevention at the lakes. And from there, I uh, put in a couple years, and then when in 2014, the legislature made funds available for counties to do aquatic invasive species prevention work. They passed a law that allocates $10 million dollars per year to all Minnesota counties based on the number of public lake accesses they have and the number of parking spaces at those accesses. Mm -hmm. So it, at that time, uh, Becker County received uh, the funding that they uh, are allocated through that, that legislation, and Becker County decided to hire a, a coordinator and assign the, the responsibilities uh, for that, that funding to the Soil and Water Conservation District uh, of Becker County. So in, in 2015, um, they posted a position for a, a county AIS coordinator, and uh, I applied and was uh, lucky enough to uh, receive an offer. Okay, and and now you're in that role. That's the the main role, I understand, and um, that's really interesting. So, so you have um, educational responsibility uh, uh, funded by the state to protect our waters from further invasion, so to say, or in a nutshell. That's right. That's exactly right. The legislation is meant to prevent the introduction and spread of aquatic invasive species at public access sites within the counties. So with that, we do a, a great deal of education and, and outreach work. Uh, just uh, yesterday, I was in the fifth grade classrooms in Detroit Lakes Uh, visiting with the, the fifth graders about what they can do when they're out at the lakes to prevent invasive species. I attend trade shows and uh, building shows and many lake association meetings and public meetings throughout the year, uh, raising awareness about the issue. But really, the bulk of what we do, education and law enforcement, is done right there at the lakes from uh, mid-May through into the fall. We hire a team of about 30 watercraft inspectors. Oh, wow. And we work at uh, the busiest lakes in Becker County. Uh, we have the authority uh, delegated through the state of Minnesota to look at people's boats and equipment inside and out and check them for invasive species uh, as they arrive and, and leave the, the county's lakes. We also have four uh, watercraft decontamination units. That is a, a portable pressure washer with, with water and a mat that can reclaim and reuse that water. So if folks... Uh, maybe have some invasive species uh, or mud or something attached to their boat, we can wash that off, get them uh, in compliance with the law and, and on the water. Also, folks who uh, wish to travel from lake to lake, uh, maybe fishermen who would like to try fishing at different spots in the county, we can uh, decontaminate their watercraft and, and reduce the risk of spreading invasive species uh, with that tool as well. Okay, so so you have uh, uh, educational Uh, responsibility or agenda, let's say, and um, but then you're also uh, inspecting. That's right. So I would say executive as well. That's right. I would say uh, the bulk of our funding, over 70% percent, goes to hiring and uh, keeping that inspection program going. And I would say statewide, um, many counties have a similar uh, budget and and allocation where. A lot of the funds go to those inspectors, the, the labor costs there, and then other funds go to uh, media projects, different kinds of outreach, um, equipment. Even uh, in some counties, they're installing permanent infrastructure, 
permanent watercraft decontamination uh, stations for mm. for boaters. So um, it's it's unique in Minnesota that uh, the funding for aquatic invasive species was allocated directly to the counties and not through a a large state agency. I think it's really uh, allowing for a lot of innovation on on the local level mm -hmm. and for unique programs that uh, might be more appropriate for for different parts of the state to to be developed uh, as opposed to uh, one entity in St. Paul having kind of a one-size-fits-all approach. There's uh, mm. all this local knowledge and, and local input going into uh, creating just a, a huge range of, of programs now. And uh, statewide, I believe in 2017, there were more than 1,000 watercraft inspectors in the state. Oh, wow. So, uh, you know, that puts Minnesota at the top nationwide in terms of watercraft inspection and aquatic invasive species prevention. So before we talk maybe about success and uh, uh, and is it really working, can you kind of give the um, educational part? Like let's say you were in the class of uh, uh, fifth graders yesterday, something similar. Can you educate us uh, on, on the purpose? Uh, Absolutely. Please. Um, really, in a nutshell, aquatic invasive species are just plants and animals or other organisms like pathogens or viruses mm -hmm. that were brought from other parts of the world, either uh, intentionally or by mistake, through things like transoceanic shipping vessels mm -hmm. or the plant and aquarium trade. Mm. Um, these organisms... Uh, then accidentally or intentionally in some cases are introduced to uh, lakes and rivers and then they cause problems. That's a critical point to remember with aquatic invasive species is that they are invasive. There's a number of species that we introduce to our lakes that aren't necessarily native to them, like a rainbow trout. They are not native, but they are not causing problems. They're mm. not causing public health or economic problems for people. So the species that we're concerned about are both not originally from our area and have the potential to cause economic, social problems. Can uh, you define that a little bit more? Like, uh, sure. The well, invasion impact? Sure. Well, uh, the most common and probably well-known aquatic invasive species in Minnesota and in the country is the, the zebra, zebra mussel. mussel. Mm. Uh, most people have heard of zebra mussels. Unfortunately, you know, in Lakes Country, we know about them all too well. Mm. And uh, they've, you know, invaded many of our most popular lakes in the, in the area. Zebra mussels were accidentally introduced to the Great Lakes by uh, shipping vessels that came over from Eastern Europe. And uh, in the, the ballast water that these large ships take on to uh, maintain stability crossing the ocean, mm. uh, different organisms were sucked up in that water and then discharged into the Great Lakes. Zebra mussels were uh, found in the Great Lakes in the late 1980s, and uh, since that time, as you know, they've, they've spread to many lakes uh, inland, um, really throughout the United States. Really, the Pacific Northwest is now the only major part of the country that has not had uh, zebra mussel problems uh, that we know about. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, um, what do they really cause or like wh wh what's happening? Sure. Um, zebra mussels are a concern for us because uh, several reasons. Really aquatic invasive species have both social uh, impacts, impacts on our use of the lakes and enjoyment of the lakes and rivers, and also those ecological impacts, the impacts to other species. And, you know, we're really concerned about both of those, and they're both very related. Um, the, the social impacts, the economic impacts of zebra mussels range from just a, an inconvenience and a nuisance at a, a swimming area. They're very sharp. They can cut uh, people's hands and feet if they're, they're in the water. They're unsightly. Uh, their, their dead bodies uh, smell uh, very bad when they wash up to, to shore. Mm. So there's the, the aesthetic and social kind of impact of zebra mussels, but really what, what I'm concerned about and what uh, I think is driving much of the, the efforts to prevent their, their spread is their uh, environmental impact. Zebra mussels uh, eat very small 
organisms in the in the water uh, called phytoplankton. They're they're very imagine just a very very tiny plant. Mm -hmm. These tiny tiny bits of algae in the lake are uh, actually really important for other animals in the lake. Juvenile fish and other species uh, feed on these things, and it's kind of forms the base of the the food chain in in a, aquatic systems. Mm. The zebra mussels. Um, really are uh, invasive because they have a tremendous ability to reproduce. They uh, reproduce a free-floating veliger. That's what a, a juvenile zebra mussel is called at just an a incredible rate. Zebra mussels can go from almost undetectable in a lake to uh, seemingly everywhere in just uh, maybe two or three growing seasons in Minnesota. They're so abundant that uh, their feeding and the waste that they produce really can, can change how lakes function and what species can thrive there, it seems, uh, at least from my observation uh, locally here. Their, their feeding clears out the water, which, which some people see as a benefit, but with that clarity comes more sunlight penetrating into the lake, which allows more plants to grow at, at deeper, you know, areas in the lake, which changes fishing, uh, changes just the amount of weeds in the lake and, and typically increases that. And also that feeding seems like it's having food chain impacts. Uh, they're stripping out this, this base of the food chain and over a long period of time, we may see uh, some species that depend on some of those things that the zebra mussels are feeding on not doing so well. Uh, one example is Lake Mille Lacs. Um, they've seen a, a pretty dramatic decline in uh, walleyes in that lake mm. and increases in, in other species like smallmouth bass. The lake had, uh, has had zebra mussels, spiny water fleas, and an invasive plant, uh, Eurasian water milfoil, for a number of years now. And it's thought that the introduction of those invasive species has played some role in the decline of the, the walleye fishery on that lake and the problems they're having with uh, recruiting healthy year classes of, of small walleyes out in Mille Lacs. Mm. Hmm. Okay. Um, um, what, like, is it working what we are trying to do, you think? Uh, um, like, what, what with the little duck that moves from one lake to the I'm concerned, like, is birds, uh, how... Are we really able to to not have uh, zebra mussels go from Pelican Lake to other lakes, even with connecting streams and whatnot? Like, well, what is it gonna? What's gonna happen? Well, it's hard to say. I think that our current efforts are slowing the spread of aquatic invasive species mm -hmm. in Minnesota. But uh, every every summer, you you see the press releases. You see that these invasive species are continuing to spread. Mm -hmm. Zebra mussels are especially difficult. As I said earlier, they create they have a free floating life stage when they're very young. What does that mean? They're it means that when they're very young, they don't have a shell, they're not attached to oh. things in the lake, like when you see an adult zebra mussel. When they're very young, they're just a little microscopic organism floating around in the water. Oh. So when Pelican Lake was infested with zebra mussels, sometime around probably two thousand seven, two thousand eight, two thousand that that time, the zebra mussel uh, babies, those villagers, floated right down the river to, to Lake Lizzie and on all the way down to the Red River, uh -huh. where they're now found uh, in the Red River all the way up to Lake Winnipeg. Um, uh -huh. It's not known whether Lake Winnipeg was infested by those uh, floating villagers or uh, overland transport of zebra mussels, but they, zebra mussels and other aquatic invasive species can spread through flooding, through uh, floating down, downstream, through connected water bodies. But by humans are by far the the biggest contributor to this problem and the biggest uh, spreader of of aquatic invasive species. Many people say, "Well, what about turtles and birds and animals?" And I really think that if if turtles and birds and animals were responsible for any significant amount of transport of zebra mussels, we would see even more zebra mussel infestations. Mm. And we would see them in lakes that are really close by, lakes that have had them. If you look at, say, uh, Pelican Lake in Ottertail County, they've had zebra mussels for close to a decade, and there are lakes very near there that, that aren't known to have zebra mussels right mm. now. 
and it, it would seem that birds do fly back and forth. Also, uh, it seems like zebra mussels are popping up in popular lakes with a lot of human activity. Mm, I see. So, it to your to your first question, can we can we slow down the spread of zebra mussels and other aquatic invasive species? I say absolutely we can, and and we have been successful in that um, since I began in 2012. It's difficult to measure the extent to which we've been successful, but just from my perspective, starting this work in 2012, I feel like very few people were aware of this issue mm -hmm. and the violation rates, uh, the number of people that were, say, not removing their drain plug, not cleaning their equipment off, were much higher than they are today. Uh, in 2017, the state of Minnesota said that 97% of the boaters that they surveyed um, but watercraft inspectors, both county watercraft inspectors and the DNR's own staff, uh, were, were following the law. 97% of the people drain, pull their mm -hmm. drain plugs mm -hmm. out and clean their equipment off. So it may be some time before we see results from these programs, but I think uh, there's definitely uh, success stories all around the state of uh, people, inspectors who have successfully protected uninfested lakes um, from, from introductions of zebra mussels. Well, I would say it's in all our best interest to to follow the rules to not invest any other infest any other healthy body of waters. What, what can you tell me about um, like you said almost a decade or pretty much a decade of uh, investigation at Pelican for example. Do we know what the cycle is until they die off because I also heard that they kind of uh, go through a cycle or something like or like will they ever be gone again or can you tell us something about it doesn't that? seem like they'll ever be gone unless uh you know tools are developed that uh, are effective a at eliminating them there are places in europe that have had uh populations of invasive zebra mussels for for many decades but like any species they need food and they reproduce at just such an extraordinary rate it seems like they can kind of eat themselves out of house and home so to speak they they reach a point where there's just too many zebra mussels and not enough food in the lake anymore mm -hmm. and their numbers kind of go down mm -hmm. it seems like they're dying off and people are seeing these dead zebra mussels wash up but what seems to happen is the the numbers decrease a little bit and the lakes you know, continue to crank out, uh, you know, food for zebra mussels. And when that food source comes back, their, their numbers come back up. Hmm. So they do, their numbers seem to go in, in cycles in, in the lakes where, where they're present. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem like, uh, you know, they're going to die off from a, a lake. There are lakes in Minnesota that have had the, the zebra mussels for even longer than Pelican. And, um, uh, they're still there, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So, um, now we uh, we know so much about zebra mussels already. I think at least uh, uh, we think we do. But like, what else is there um, that we should be um, concerned about or or cautious? Uh, let's say, uh, what else can we do better? Or what other species are coming that we maybe don't want to or that are not native? I guess. Yeah, I think that's a really important uh, thing to mention. Um, I I'm concerned about invasive plants in our lakes mm -hmm. quite a bit. Um, we were talking earlier about zebra mussels and how they both have kind of a social uh, impact mm -hmm. and an ecological impact. Plants do as well, and I think uh, plants almost have the potential to have a greater social impact to our lakes. Um, it's, a, it's an aesthetic thing. Uh, people want uh, clean lakes to swim in, and they don't want to swim through mats of invasive plants. Yeah. Uh, some of the invasive plants that we deal with in Minnesota are uh, Eurasian water milfoil. That's a, an invasive aquatic plant that is... How does is, it look? How does it look? Yeah, like, w what is it like? Oh, it is just an aggressive aquatic plant that can grow uh, very rapidly. It can grow right up to the surface of the water and uh, create mats in in some situations and in some lakes it can just grow really abundantly it can displace native plants and uh, cause problems for swimming and boating mm -hmm. down in uh, the twin cities metro area it's really it's been a problem uh, 
probably for my whole life for decades mm. and i think we've been very lucky in uh becker ottertail county to have been spared so far from uh, the impacts of that particular species uh, a new species that's uh, kind of on our radar is starry stonewort starry stonewort is an invasive uh, macro algae it looks like a, a plant but it's not actually a vascular plant it's um it's a, a large algae similar to our native uh, cara, mm -hmm. or uh, some people call it sand grass or musk grass, that kind of gritty, grassy stuff that's in the lake. Mm -hmm. It's similar to that, but it grows very, very aggressively in some uh, situations, and uh, management of that species has, has proven very difficult. Uh, it's, it's found in a handful of the lakes, uh, in, in northern Minnesota near uh, Beltrami County and, and Cass County, lakes like uh, Cass and uh, Winnie uh, it's been found in, also in Upper Red Lake, and also uh, down near the, the Alexander, the um, St. Cloud area, Lake Coronis was the first lake there that w where Starry Stonewort was found in the state. And at Lake Coronis there's you know, a couple hundred acres of this stuff. Mm. It is a, a significant uh, issue as far as boating and, and swimming and, and lakeshore property values, I think may, may see some impact from, from this. It's very, uh, you know, unsightly in the lake. Mm. And uh, how do we get rid of it? Or like, can you net, can you take it out with? Is, is that the stuff with the boat where the boat comes? And yeah, you can you can scoop it out of the lake <laughs> with uh, you know equipment. You can apply algicides and chemicals to it and kill it, but it just has a capacity to uh, regenerate itself and grow back mm. the following year. Uh, it produces. It gets its name from a little star-shaped growth called a bulbil. That's its uh, its reproductive. Uh, feature or structure on on the the starry stonewort those bulbils settle down into the sediment uh, where they can't you know really effectively be exposed to uh, algicides or chemicals and the following year the, they just sprout a bunch of new uh, starry stonewort from those bulbils so really our best strategy with starry stonewort and any other invasive is prevention mm. uh, the the management is very costly and with some species like zebra mussels there really is no effective management uh, lake wide mm. so um, you know prevention of the spread of aquatic invasive species is really the, th the, th the thrust of these these programs the reason why that 10 million dollar uh, funding was was created and uh, the whole focus of, of my program in, in Becker County, aside from some small grants that we provide uh, groups who are doing management of flowering rush and curly leaf pondweed, some of the uh, more local invasive aquatic plants that we, we have in the area. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a social responsibility, a community responsibility almost uh, from all of us uh, um, to protect our, our native uh, lakes or like to not invade with non-native um, uh, invasive species yeah it is it is and it's not too difficult I think to to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species there's the perception there among some people that uh, you know their spread is inevitable it can't be stopped and uh, I really I really don't think that that's the case I think that uh, the actions that are required by state law will effectively slow the spread of uh, invasive species and uh, to me as a boater it's not really too much to ask. Really, if everyone who transported boats and uh, other equipment around the state of Minnesota would uh, just take a minute to review those laws, look at the signage that's posted at public access sites, and, and just take a minute to uh, check over your equipment. Remove any plants, invasive or not, the plants are a home for zebra mussels, they attach to them in the lakes, mm -hmm. and moving a clump of plants from an infested lake is a, a, a great way to infest a new lake. Mm -hmm. Take a moment to look at your boat trailer and equipment for, for plants and drain water. Like I said earlier, those zebra mussels are microscopic and free-floating in mm -hmm. the water. If you drain that water, well, then you're, you're also draining those juvenile zebra mussels. So um, I do think that um, simple simple prevention practices can go a long way in the state of Minnesota taking a minute to just check over your equipment, drain the water out, and remove plants and mud will really significantly change uh, the, the rate that these species spread around the state.
Yeah, I can only agree. I think it's it's almost common sense. Uh, um, if I enjoyed that one leg and I'm putting others at risk uh, to to follow those uh, guidelines and rules to protect other bodies, um, it's kind of like I don't I don't put oil somewhere or drain my oil uh, to and in, to invade and in the, the ground for groundwater, and I shouldn't carry on those things uh, from one to another lake, right? I mean, oh, absolutely. I think it is uh, all of our responsibilities to, uh, you know, think about um, our actions and how they might uh, affect the the things that we care about for for future generations. It's, uh, you know, of course required by law, but even even not being a, a legal requirement, I think it's, uh, you know, just a, a good practice for boaters to get in the habit of. It's not too much to ask. Uh, the state of Minnesota is not prohibiting people from enjoying the lakes. We're not closing down lake accesses. Yeah. We're not. I'm not interested in closing down any lake accesses or restricting anyone's ability to go to any lake they want at any time. I really think that uh, that's the whole reason that I, I really want to pursue this work is so we can continue to yeah. enjoy the lakes. And uh, I don't think a strategy like that would would be very effective. I think uh, maybe some very special lake somewhere could have uh, a higher level of protection than we can offer in Becker County. But uh, at this time, I, I think that um, education and looking at the accesses that are very busy, that are, are known to have zebra mussels in an effort to kind of contain them at those lakes, uh, will, will be somewhat effective. Time will tell, I guess, uh, how effective these programs will be. Yeah, yeah. And... Um uh, uh, you, you go around and, and speak to groups, uh, uh, I think uh, local clubs, uh, you mentioned schools. Um, people can invite you to educate, like uh, you said, um, lake associations. What's an address where people can reach you? Uh, what's the website or what do they Google then? What Absolutely. You can, you can track us down at beckerswcd.org. Uh, all of our contract information there for the different programs that we offer uh, is there. And... Um, my contact information is there. I'm happy to speak to any kind of group, uh, lake associations, civic organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that education and, and raising awareness of the issue is, is uh, really important in this, and that's a, a big part of my job description is uh, that, oh, that work, that, that outreach work, yes. Yeah. No, I, I think that's great. I'm glad that I, I had you here. And um, uh, I usually like to finish... Um, uh, what is your lake life? Um, how do you define your own lake life? I heard boating already, but um, tell me a little bit about uh, what's lake life to you, personally. Personally, to me, lake life is about the tremendous uh, diversity of animals that that live in the lakes. Um, we're we're very lucky here. We're blessed here to have lakes with uh, a diversity of fish species, diversity of bird species that uh, use the riparian areas, uh, all kinds of wildlife. They're out there at the lakes. My idea of, of lake life is going to a lake, fishing, and uh, not even just fishing, but just being there with all of the different animals and plants. You can go out to the lakes, you can look at these birds and animals, and uh, you can feel joy. You really can. These uh, these places are really special, and, and to me that's like life, is just going to the lakes, seeing wildlife, and, and uh, feeling joy. Yeah, I agree. And uh, actually that was really interesting because uh, lake life is not just my lake life. Lake life actually is uh, more the ecosystem. Uh, I'm, I'm not even part of lake life. I take advantage of the life in the lake. That's something <laughs> that I just heard you saying at least. That's really interesting. Um, closing question, maybe. A lake ecosystem, because I'm not the biologist here, actually. I'm just the consumer, the lake life consumer, unfortunately, but or luckily. Um, can you tell me what, like, how many roughly birds, uh, you know, I know that, for example, deer even drink out of the lake. We have maybe 75 different fish. So we have micro. How, many li how much life is in a, in a lake ecosystem? Do you know roughly? There could be there could be hundreds of different species that are somehow related to the lake. If you think of the the birds that uh, the the diversity of bird species mm -hmm. that use lakes, the terrestrial animals like uh, 
you know, like you mentioned, uh, deer. Think of uh, beavers and, and mm-hmm. muskrats and uh, those kind of semi, you know, aquatic mammals. It's, you know, I'm probably the wrong person to ask that question, but b- in one lake system, it could support dozens of species of unique plants. Yeah. Probably, you know, uh, from the small species of fish up to the more recognizable game fish, there could be 20 to 40 different unique fish species in a lake and uh take that with all the the different you know terrestrial species and birds that that depend on the lakes like loons you know there's a lot of life that these lakes are 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 supporting and the introduction of invasive species just you know competes with the the habitat that they need and in some cases displaces those species and a lake is unique Uh, a terrestrial animal whose habitat is altered or destroyed can in many cases move somewhere else. They can migrate. Mm-hmm. But in a lake, if that species habitat is changed or taken away or, or altered mm-hmm. or destroyed in some way, a fish can't just uh, swim no. down, down the road to a new lake that's, that's clean. A fish can't just swim up to Canada, no. and uh, I- especially in, in a, a closed basin lake like many of our lakes around here. They're, they're stuck there, mm-hmm. and they need that habitat there intact for us to, to continue to, to enjoy them there. Yeah, but you know what I actually just realized, and I hope I'm not alone, like how uh, little we are in the ecosystem and we are really just taking away because nature, uh, you know, the the lake life is probably dozens or a hundred life living creatures and we are impacting it. So I think protecting it and protecting it from invasive species to keep that alive like you just described the fish cannot escape they are then unfortunately gone is our doing and our responsibility if we want to take out of the lake we need to so more protect it you know what i'm saying absolutely yeah i i can see that because lake life is a very selfish almost uh approach when i say this is my lake life actually i'm a guest in the environment of the nature environment correct absolutely that's a good way to look at it and uh you know if people had you know just some understanding of that we don't all have to be these uh radical environmentalists to recognize the economic benefits the social benefits of intact lake ecosystems Uh, i was telling you early earlier dirk they they estimate fishing's economic impact to be I think around four billion dollars yeah so we don't all have to be uh you know radical environmentalists to see benefits from this our tax base around here is largely uh you know based on lake lake influenced lake lakefront properties um i want to keep those values strong and uh you know have a have a good tax base in my in my community i'm not just about out here for the the birds and the butterflies and the the animals for me personally that's very important but i recognize that uh not everyone feels that way so i also try to touch on those more tangible economic benefits the lakes drive just a tremendous amount of economic activity and i think we should try to maintain that i really think it's in absolutely everyone's best interest to maintain that as much as possible yeah i agree i agree well i i think we learned a lot um do you want to add anything that i miss asking A question that you would like to share? No, no, I really uh, enjoyed coming in for the podcast today. I just want to close with uh, reminding everyone that uh, invasive species problems can be prevented in the state. We don't have a silver bullet solution yet, but we are working on developing tools to lessen the impacts of aquatic invasive species. But prevention will always be uh, really important, even as those tools are developed. So take a moment. Look at your equipment when you're leaving the lake, drain out the water, clean off the plants and mud, and uh, just by doing that, you're uh, really significantly reducing the risk of spreading aquatic invasive species. Yeah, thank you for doing that. Thank you, Carl, for coming, and uh, you have a wonderful weekend. Great, thank you, Dirk. Thanks. Yeah, this was already our uh, newest episode of the Lake Life Weekend podcast. We sure hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Tune in again next week with another great guest and updates. Always check out our website, uh, lakelifeweekend.com. And if you have some comments, please feel free to email us at hello at lakelifeweekend.com. And uh, you have a wonderful weekend ahead. Uh